after the congressional hearings, there was all this alien UFO fever. And so people were asking us, how do you pastor somebody who has a UFO fever and is addicted to the YouTube videos and are, have become... So we, what, produced so, a cl- so we produced a class on it. You produced a class mm-hmm. on on what is the biblical view of extraterrestrials? Yeah, well, more uh, sort of working with how to treat the biblical text in a way that is not abusive, that takes what's taking place in culture and running with it in a way that becomes unfaithful to the exposition of Scripture. So uh, you created this thing called Theos. You Obviously, Theos means God in mm-hmm. Greek. Um, so... You, you, you describe it online as not woke. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that we have to do that in this day and age, yeah. but I think it's wonderful that you say that because yeah. it's kind of, kind of, it's unbelievably important that we're clear, yeah. that we're not going to be woke, that we're going to be clear about yeah. what the Bible says and what is true, and we're not going to apologize for it because it's beautiful. Yeah. So, so, so my three essentials are um, we're theologically conservative, you know, in the, 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 in the ancient history uh, or historical Christian uh, orthodoxy is how I'd put it. And then number two, we're politically conservative and we're not just unapologetic about it. I, I think that um, every school in America, I mean, j- just about, they are openly politically uh, left or progressive and they embrace those values. And yeah. the, you know, and so we embrace the values of political conservatism. Um, no, I'm a con- because because you believe they're actually true. Well, not, not just because it's your tribe. Not only that, but if you read through through church history, these guys are not progressives politically. You know, like um, Polycarp was not a liberal. I mean, read Saint uh, Saint Augustine's City of God. It's a pretty conservative, uh, you know, estimation of church and government and politics, etc. So, um, all that to say, and then um, and then finally, we are unapologetically charismatic. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and um, and so that's one of our. Th- those are our distinctives. So you wouldn't describe yourselves as pinched and reformed. Well, half of our faculty are reformed. Okay, but they all believe in the holy the, the gifts of the Holy. They're they're, they're not cessationists. So they're, so, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You're willing to go there. Yeah. It's why I uh, I like you guys so much. Okay, so Theos University. Uh, there's a book now called Theos Starter Pack. Mm-hmm. We got to talk about the book Theos Starter Pack. When we come back, we'll talk about Theos Starter Pack. Uh, toward a recovery of essential Christianity with Chris Palmer and Nathan Finocchio. Hey there, folks. If you enjoy this video and want to see more interviews like this one, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Please just hit the subscribe button below. Click the notification bell so you don't miss new content every single week. 90% of you who watch are not subscribed, and you could be in the first 100,000 subscribers to my channel. I would love that. Please subscribe. God bless you. So who would be interested in Theos U? And what's the difference between Theos U and Theos Seminary? And, and who is taking these classes? Okay, so, so, so everybody, who, anybody who wants to learn uh, theology, uh, particularly th- conservative theology, Politically conservative theology, charismatic theology, and, and I should say once again, charismatic theology. What does that even mean? It, it, it means nothing and everything. Um, as I said, so for example, my brother is is we're, we're ecumenical, so my brother is high church leaning. Um, I would probably be high church leaning. Chris is definitely sacramental, but he's he's Pentecostal. And then we have David Campbell and John Adams and Thomas West, Doctor Thomas West, and who. They are uh, they're reformed as they're as reformed as as John Calvin, you know, and so. But we're, we all imagine be- John Calvin being open to the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, well, I think his hat would fly off. <laughs> certainly, <laughs> that that pinched hat that he wears in all the portraits. Yeah. Um, but so, but what you're talking about is actual Christianity. In yeah. other words, you're interested in what is true. Right. It's, it's it's not about a brand or denomination. You're you're open to yeah. actual Christianity. Yeah. So we have, I think, about. 8,000 subscribers, and half of those are church domains. So a lot of pastors uh, use, we have over 100 courses on Theos U for 15 bucks a month, and, and, and it's academic. It's, it's, um, so we have hot topics that will deal with, you know, let's say, women in ministry, 
Um, you know, what are we supposed to believe about the transgenderism? You know, and, and so we're resource best. And then we have we have Romans, we have a Greek Greek one, we have Greek exe exegesis. So you can go as nerdy as you want, you know, or you can go, you know, topically. Yeah, we have a lot of pastors that reach out and want us to resource them. For instance, after the congressional hearings, there was all this alien UFO fever. And so people were asking us, how do you pastor somebody who has a UFO fever and is addicted to the YouTube videos and are, have become... So we, what, so, a so we produced a class on it. You produced a class mm -hmm. on, on what is the biblical view of extraterrestrials? Yeah, well, more uh, sort of working with how to treat the biblical text in a way that is not abusive, that takes what's taking place in culture and running with it in a way that becomes unfaithful to the exposition of Scripture and also talking about how to pastor people through it, especially those that have an interest in it. So the point I'm making is that there are classes that are that niche in Theoshu that help pastors that are kind of weaving their way through these things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how many classes did you say you offer currently? We add two every month, but we have over 100 currently. 100 courses? Yeah, courses. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, courses. That's not just classes. And, and each course is how many classes? Depends. Some of them are... We aim each course to be six to eight hours. Yeah, six to eight hours. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and so, I mean, you sort of answered this, but wh so why are you doing this? You're doing this because no one else is doing we're this. We're doing this because Bible colleges are slipping into progressivism. That's why we're doing this. What? I haven't heard that at all. Um, it's kind of funny because it's so obvious that seminaries, quote unquote, Christian colleges, you know, they're all evangelicalism is slipping mm -hmm. into progressivism. And it's, it's disturbing, at least disturbing, to watch. And you see yourself as a healthy antidote to that. Mm -hmm. um, and you're usually a lot of fun. That's the impression I get from you guys, that you're fun. Got to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, theology is, you got to add a lot of water. It's, it's dry stuff. Yeah. Chesterton said the test of a good faith is its ability to laugh at itself. And so there comes a place where humor plays in the online spaces that allows us to laugh at things that are part of our, say, subculture that we can point out and say, look at, we're laughing at this because it's not part of essential Christianity. These are things that we have sort of designed and innovated ourselves, and maybe we should look at them and kind of laugh and appreciate the humor. In we them. have a meme page that essentially lampoons everybody and anyone. <laughs> But it, it, it's, it's, it's in hilarious how it's a, it's a giant recruiting tool for students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we had a kid. So we have a, we, so Theos U is the subscription model. It's kind of like the audit program of, we, we also have a seminary called Theos Seminary. We have 200 students in there. And we had a student um, e email us and he, he uh, signed up for school. A master's for seminary. program. Yeah, in, in our master's program. And he goes, I was just following the meme page. And from the meme page, now I'm in this. Now I'm in your seminary. And his wife. Yeah, and his yeah. So it's like, th th humor is the tool, and it's the it's the language. You know, um, uh, once again, Ch Chesterton. I love piggybacking off of him. But you know, humor isn't a um, it isn't a thing. It's just a language. You know, and and you, you either speak it or you don't. But it's definitely the language of millennials and Gen Z particularly memeology. We actually have a class on meme making. You have a class on meme making? Yes. Yeah, yeah so that essentially it talks about how to condense your language in a way that's effective so where people don't have to think through it exhaustively and it makes a point quickly and it creates discussion around it that causes people to learn. <laughs> what are some of the essays that people will find in this book, Theos Starter Pack? We have essays from, for example, Elijah Lamb, um, he's 20 years old, and he's one of our faculty. He's just a young, brilliant thinker. Um, and, uh, and then we have essays from you know, David Campbell, who is, I don't know, north of 70. But they're on, uh, give me an example. Yeah, so we have everything on recovering apocalyptic, the, the biblical genre apocalyptic, because a lot of people, they know eschatology, but they're not familiar with the genre to help lead them into a, maybe the way that traditionally we've thought about eschatology. We have things on recovering language in the sense of how do we use language faithfully as Christians to represent historic Christian orthodoxy and, and deviate it away from how postmodernism has taught Gen Z millennials that language doesn't mean anything. Um, things about sin and 
perhaps the word of faith doctrine and prosperity doctrine have moved people into what we would, a big word I'll explain it, an over-realized eschatology, meaning that it doesn't think that we live in the, the already and not yet. Uh, how do we appropriately think about what we possess as Christians in our battle over sin and how much can we expect to receive in this life as a result of the work of Christ? We have topics on... I wrote an essay on, um, on reading scripture. So every January, I read the entire Bible in 30 days. And I've done it for, I don't know, 10 years now. There's about... There's, there's, uh, I, you, I, now, be honest. Do you <clears throat> skim numbers? No. Uh, no, I don't. No, I only skim... The only thing that I skim is, um, <laughs> is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the genealogies. Definitely don't read through those. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, but you don't skim numbers. No. Um, <laughs> does anyone not skim numbers? I skim it to make you feel better. Numbers I, got, I, got some good... Numbers slaps. There's some good stuff in numbers. I think I would read... The first time I would highlight all the good stuff and then just read that. I think Numbers 13 says that like Moses was the most humblest man. If you get to Numbers... <laughs> most just, humblest? They wouldn't say most humblest. They well, would just say yeah. humblest or most humble. Yeah. Gosh. Most humblest is kind of like... It's street though, Eric, you know? Yeah. If, yeah. If you get yeah. to Numbers... You know, it's like ask me a question type thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like... Sure. <laughs> you don't um, speak Walmart? I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. But I'm not bringing it up. Um, okay, so you... Um, you guys like to have fun, and to me, that's a biblical value, because humor and truth are inextricably intertwined. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting, since you guys describe yourselves as non-woke, the woke world is anti-humor, mm. just like, you know, the Soviet Union was anti-humor and the Nazis were anti-humor, because humor is keeping it real and is not afraid of truth. Yeah. And so that's interesting to me that we're at a point now where when you describe yourself as politically and theologically conservative, you're the funny guys. Yeah, there's a lot of irony in scripture. And we think that irony and being satirical is a biblical value. One of the greatest things that you can move through the gospels and kind of, if you read it closely, you'll find out that there are a number of passages that are actually ironic and, and somewhat satirical. Can, and, you, can you give me an example? Yeah, so I'll give you, just recently I was reading the book of Revelation. And uh, you said the Gospels, though. Yeah, well, it's any, yeah. any narrative. So you could even do the yeah. book of Revelation, which is a narrative. Sure, sure. So there is a place where it shows the name. It, it gives you the name Diabolos, it gives you the name Satanas, and it gives you the name Serpent. And it's all there. And around it, it talks about how Christ, how it's been cast down. And then it gives you the three names, and then it shows it's been cast down. So almost in an, an ironic way, the name of Satan is between to a, uh, we call it an, an inclusio, a sandwiching effect. It shows that on both sides he's been cast down. The way that you look that at is, it. That is a level of craftsmanship, if I can use the word, that I wouldn't necessarily expect to find. In other yeah. words, that that would be intentional on the part of the author, or, uh, unless it was simply uh, God's intention and, you know, John got it kind of uh, like... Uh, you know, the ball was kind of tossed to him and, and he just went with it for the layup. But that's interesting to me. I wouldn't think of it. Well, the other thing, too, is you, you have to remember that an author like John, maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I think that these guys were more Hellenized than we realize. They would have been more uh, well acquainted with, you know, the Greek tragedies, um, socio-rhetorical Greek commentaries, Greco-Roman literature. And so... They'd use chiastic structure. You know, there's, there's going to be... Some hey, this is a family show, please. There's, <laughs> is, what is chiastic structure? <laughs> there, uh, well, chiasm is when there's, you know, for, it's kind of like a poetic meter, but there's like A, B, C, B, okay, A. Okay, got it. You know what I mean? Got it. Um, but they'll use um, inclusios. They're going to use these, these rhetorical devices that are common in f first century or, you know... The, the world that they're living in, and so so they're they're real authors, and so when they're writing, the original audience is reading this and going, they're recognizing the patterns just like they'll recognize the patterns or the emphatic patterns that you know Homer or Aeschylus, you know. But isn't it amazing that two thousand years later we're just discovering this? Isn't it a little bit bizarre that well, it's taken us two thousand years to kind of notice? Well, this the thing, stuff? what's interesting is that. One thing that we write in the book is that early readers would notice these things. Careful readers actually would notice these types of things and, and, and outline them in their commentaries, like Victor Aeneas and different 
people reading throughout the centuries would going, know. Going to a, a break. Forgive me. We'll be right back talking to Chris Palmer and Nathan Finocchio. Since we just have a few minutes left today, what else should we talk about, Chris? I think, I think what we can understand is that in a time where people are confused online, what's going on with TikTok, and they're spending tons of hours online, they don't have to deconstruct their faith and completely demolition it to where it's nothing and walk away from it. But if they check out something like the OSU, they can see that there are contours and depths to the faith that will help them appreciate it at a depth that they've never perhaps discovered and understand how wonderful the message of Jesus Christ is, how what we were talking about, how there's so much detail involved in conveying that message, and theology becomes a very exciting discovery at that point. I, I will accept that answer. Uh, no, that's just... Um, it's wonderful that that you two have been have been doing this. How many years have you been at this? This is the fourth year. The fourth year, mm -hmm. and you just what? You just call in favors. You call up a friend. You go, "You're amazing at this. I want you to teach a course." Yeah, we try to bring in the best, the people who are on the cutting edge of what they teach, to, that, to that, offer classes to us that that share our values. Yeah. Do you think? I mean. It's just interesting to me the way things are changing and the way so much is going online. Uh, you know, in the past I would have said, oh, that's a bad thing. Now I think it's a good thing mm -hmm. because more and more people can find what you're doing because it's needed and uh, because they're not finding it at whatever these seminaries or, or, or Christian colleges that are, as we were saying, increasingly woke. Um, so wh where do you think... Uh, Nathan, where, where do you get your backbone in, in, you know, being able to stand up the way that you do? Because the pressure is so strong to conform, you know, to the, to the zeitgeist. Yep. I don't know. Um, you just surround yourself with good friends and uh, have good people in your life. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that at the end of the day, I want to be faithful to Jesus. I want to be a faithful witness. And... Um, you know, it's, it's, um, I really believe in Jesus and I really believe that the scriptures are, uh, I, I can't divorce Jesus from his words. And so, yeah, I want to, I want to be a faithful reader and I don't want to be conformed to the pattern of this world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And that's, um, yeah, I, I, so, so for me, it's probably, it's a conviction thing for me. It's, it's not, it's not something that dwells, you know, uh, um, in the, you know, I, I don't want to be uh, a, an intellectual or a, or a Christian or whatever that is, is disconnected from, from um, I don't know, I don't know. I, the word has to become flesh. It needs to be incarnated, you know, like, and, and I think that, um, you know, I, I don't want to be disconnected from, from Scripture and disconnected from reality, and I need to, give, I have to give an account to Jesus, you know, so for me, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a conviction thing. 